Okay, if you'll take your Bibles, please open them to the book of Hebrews and the seventh chapter. Hebrews chapter 7, starting at verse 4 once more. And we come to this passage, I think, for the final time. We're going to move on from here after today. So if you will join me in standing. Hebrews chapter 7, beginning at verse 4. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who received the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people, according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here, mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. And even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would give to us understanding. And Lord, I pray that you would help us see the clarity of what is given in Scripture. I pray, God, that you would clarify my thinking, that I would speak and communicate truthfully what you've given. And I pray, God, that you would burden each of our hearts to understand the reality of our covenant relationship, our commitment to you. And God, we pray that as we consider both tithes and priesthoods and the dance therein, that you would let us understand. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I do want to give you a, a disclaimer one more time. Um, I know we have been speaking about this passage and dealing at least in part and in passing with tithes for quite a while. But I would commend to you the truth that we are doing that because that is what this passage teaches. It's not that I'm begging for money. I'm not asking you to, to do something just because I want to. I am speaking to you what God says in his word, and, and I'm not contriving this. I, I think that we're going to be done with this passage and done with this topic today. Um, God knows. I know. I think that's where I am, and I think that's what's going to happen. Um, so, bear with us as, as, we, as we crack this open one last time. There is a connection between the priesthood, the people, and the tithe. And there's much of which the tithe speaks of besides merely our money. It's a confession of our relationship, and it is a confession of our dependence and our obedience. But it's also a confession of God's providence for his people, both in things material and in things spiritual. It spoke and it speaks through the priesthood and its conclusion. It speaks through the conclusion of the priesthood in Christ and it speaks even now as God's people faithfully contribute to the kingdom, confessing that God is more than able and abundantly faithful to provide more than we So the first thing that I want to point out to us is that the tithe by itself is a representation of a principle. And it is reserved unto God. The tithe reminds us that we ourselves are reserved unto God. That we belong to Him. It doesn't take a mathematician to say that 90% is less than 100%. And if you think that you can do more with your 100% than you can with 90%, you have not understood the lesson. Because God's math doesn't work quite like ours. God's math says that, yes, I understand the numbers may say this, but the numbers don't reflect the fact that you are mine and all that you have is mine, and I require your obedience. So when we deal with the question of the tithe, and we deal with the question of what God calls us to do and calls us to give and to surrender, it is not about financial decisions. It seems like it. And that's why everybody gets in a toot. Everybody gets their tongues tied in a knot. They get their, their hair twisted up. They get their noses pinched and their ears flamed because they think all preachers want to talk about is their money. But I don't care about your money except where it reflects the obedience of your heart. 
That's the issue. Because the tithe is really about our obedience unto God. Leviticus 27.30 says this, All of the tithes of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. So there's a statement of ownership. It is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. So the tithe belongs to God. But more than that, that reminds us that we ourselves, as His people, belong to God. All of creation belongs to God. He made it. It's His. But we, as His chosen people, belong to Him in a special sort of way. We, as His chosen people, belong to God in a way that nothing else can say, I'm His. We belong to Him because He has chosen us to be His. And we belong to Him because He has purchased us with His own blood. We belong to Him because He Himself has set Himself to watch over us and guard us and guide us. And He Himself has determined that we as His people would bear the blessing of His own care. All that we are is God's. It's His name on us. It's His purchase price over us. And therefore, all that we have belongs to God. Every single thing. All that we do is required by God to submit to Him. So every decision that we make, not just our financial decisions, but our decisions about time, our decisions about entertainment, our decisions about participation in things, our decisions about how we speak, about who we engage in relationships with. I could go on and on and on. All of these decisions are wrapped up in what it means for us to belong to God. And God says, all of that is mine. The tithe is merely one of the most visible ways that we can acknowledge the rest of it. It's one of those ways that can be measured very easily. There's an old saw among preachers that says, I can tell how much you love God if you give me free access to two things, your checkbook and your daytimer. I don't know if anybody uses a daytimer anymore, but it's been said that way for years. I use one. But the point is that by judging how you spend your time and judging how you spend your money, we can measure how determined we are to submit ourselves to God. And that's really the principle of the tithe. It's the idea that God says, I know this doesn't make sense to you. I know you think to yourself, there's no way that can work. But God says, I assure you, it does. I assure you that you will be more profitable, more prosperous, more successful, more blessed, more amazed by giving me the first 10% of all that you make and allowing me to bless the remaining 90 instead of going head to head with me against that 10%. Because you will not win the conflict. It is our means of saying to God, I am obeying who you are. I am obeying your command. And more than that, it is our confession that we trust God to be faithful to what he says. Because what's our reason for not obeying in the time? I don't believe you. That's what it comes down to. You, you can dress it up however you want. You can say, preacher, I just don't have the money. There, there's too many bills. There, there's too many reasons. I, I just can't. But at the bottom of it, God doesn't say to us, tithe if you're able. He says, tithe. And, and so our reason for not obeying is really very simple. Either I don't love him and I don't care what he says, or I just don't believe him. So when we engage in faithfulness to the tithe, we are acknowledging that we believe God is going to be faithful to his word. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 26. Deuteronomy 26. Moses is giving his final statements to the people of Israel before he's about to go die. Israel is about to enter into the promised land. And this is what... Moses reminds the people of. So the Lord brought us up out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. 
He has brought us to this place and he has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which you, O Lord, have given me. Then you set it before the Lord your God and shall worship before the Lord your God. So you shall rejoice in every good thing which the Lord your God has given you to your house, you and the Levite and the stranger who is among you. And when you have finished laying aside all the tithe of your increase in the third year, the year of tithing, and have given it to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat within your gates and be filled, then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the holy tithe from my house, and also I have given it to the Levite, to the stranger, fatherless and will, according to all your commandments, which you have commanded me. And I have not transgressed your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. So it is directly a covenant issue. It is us saying, God, you have been faithful. You have done what you said you would do. And I believe that you will continue to do what you say you will do. I believe that you will continue to be faithful to your word. And that you will continue to be faithful to your people. I have no physical evidence that by giving the tithe, I will increase my finances. I have only your promise. Now, those who have tested God in this and those who have tried God in this can give you the evidence of their own experience. But in the end, it can be explained away. People will do exactly that. They will say, oh, yes, but that only happened because this happened and that happened. And this person did this and that thing didn't break it. Those are all things that God uses. God uses means. And so those who have been faithful in the tithe for years or decades or even a few months will be able to give testimony to how God is always faithful. But in the end, you have to believe that on the front end. Because God is not going to show you the mercies prior to the obedience. He calls us to obey. He calls us to do it because part of what we're doing in giving the tithe is giving confession to his faithfulness based on what he has done and based on what he will do. And it is a covenant relationship that God uses to bind his people to himself. Look back in Deuteronomy a little bit to chapter 12. Deuteronomy chapter 12. We're going to start reading in verse 1. These are the statutes and the judgments which you shall be careful to observe in the land which the Lord your God of your fathers has given you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. You shall utterly destroy all the places where nations which you shall dispossess serve their gods, on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You shall destroy their altars, break down their sacred pillars, and burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names from that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things, but you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place, and there you shall go. There you shall take your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the heave offerings of your hand, your vowed offerings, your freewill offerings, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice in all to which you have put your hand, you and your household in which the Lord your God has blessed you. You shall not do as we do as we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. For as yet you have not come to the rest and the inheritance which the Lord your God has given you. But when you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God has given you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies around about, so that you dwell in safety, then there will be the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. There you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, and all your choice offerings which you vow to the Lord. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and your daughters and your male and your female servants and the Levite who is within your gates, since he has no portion nor inheritance with you. Take heed to yourself that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see, but in the place which the Lord chooses. In one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I command you. So what Moses is telling the people, what God is telling the people through Moses, is that 
they have a responsibility to obey God, not only in the act of giving, but in the manner of giving. And he specifically is talking about the, the question of offering on every high hill and every high place and all the things that are, that are being done. And I love the statement that he makes. You shall not do as we are doing here. Every man doing what is right in his own eyes. In other words, you haven't come into the land of promise yet. And you guys have been just kind of free to wander your way and do your thing. But now we are coming into the land of promise. And now a structure has been given. And God expects you to obey according to his structure. Now specifically for us as Christians in this day and age... That means that we have a responsibility to do what God tells us to do according to the manner that God tells us to do it. So when the person says to me, hey, preacher, is it okay if I give some money to the Red Cross and count that as my tithe? What's my answer? No. You can give money to the Red Cross, although I wouldn't suggest it. Look at their financial accounting. It's horrifying. The money they waste on executives and jets and all that sort of thing. I wouldn't support that organization. But... Any organization that is not the church, can I give my money to plant trees in Israel and count it as my tithe? No. Can I give my money to this, this pair of ministry, this, this guy who preaches on TV and count it as my tithe? No. You can give money to all those people if you want, but your tithe belongs to God and the place that he has ordained it is in the local church. He has ordained that the first 10% of your increase belongs to him, period. And you give that tithe, and you give that tithe to the local church, and anything that you give beyond that is your free will offering to do with as you will. But you have to first meet the principle of the tithe, and God is very clear that this is part of the covenant relationship that he calls us into. And he calls us into it primarily because it makes us uncomfortable. Look, God doesn't need your tithe. We read Psalm 50 this morning, and there's a reason why we read Psalm 50. It's a long psalm, but throughout it, God makes it very plain. I don't need your stuff. He says that if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. If I were actually hungry, if I actually needed the bulls and the goats to sustain me, I would just go get them off the field because they're mine. I'm not going to take your goat. I'll get my own. They taste better in the wild anyway. Right? If, if God needed our things, he wouldn't be much of a God. And he makes the point that the tithe is not for his sake, but for ours. Amen. He makes the point that the whole purpose of the tithe is that we need to cast ourselves upon him. We need to trust him. We need to give examples and we need to give evidence not only to ourselves, but to the community of faith around us, that God is always faithful to his word. Because here's how this works. Those of you who are being faithful in the tithe know there are people in your life who are not. And those people know that you tithe because they know that you obey Christ. They assume it. So at some point in your life, they're going to come to you and go, so talk to me about this. Right? Right? When they do, you have the opportunity to give them the benefit of your experience to tell them, you know what? God has been so faithful to me. Because God is always faithful. And we need to engage with that faithfulness with the fullness of what we are. We need to cast ourselves upon God saying, Lord, I trust you. I believe you. I know that what you say you actually mean and what you promise you actually do. And I'm going to cast myself into eternity, swinging on the scarlet thread of your grace and knowing that nothing in the world will ever shake me loose. Now, here's the question. If I can trust him with my soul, why can't I trust him with my wallet? Or maybe I should put the question another way. If I can't trust him with my wallet, am I actually trusting him with my soul? Now, don't mishear me. I'm not equating the tithe to your salvation, okay? We're not Roman Catholic. That's not the point. The point is that our trust and our faithful obedience to God's commands is a really good temperature gauge for how much we actually believe and trust Him in things that are far more earnest. 
Make sense? This is for us. God doesn't need it. He doesn't need our tithe. He doesn't need our giving. He has everything that he needs, and he gives us the tithe as an issue of principle. Now, he gives us the tithe as an issue of principle now, and he gave the issue of tithe as an issue of principle with an additional feature in the Old Testament. And that additional feature was the priesthood. So the priesthood of Levi was the people that stood between God and his people. And they received the tithe in the place of God. The tithe was paid to the Levites because the Levites did not receive an inheritance. And where God said, the whole earth is mine and the tithe belongs to me, he then turned right around and he entrusted it to the tribe of Levi. Look at Numbers chapter 18. Numbers 18 and we'll start at verse 21, just read a few verses here. So Numbers chapter 18 says this, starting at verse 21. Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Hereafter, the children of Israel shall not come near the tabernacle of meeting lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall perform the work of the tabernacle of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity, and it shall be a statue forever. Throughout your generations, that among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. And again, verse 24, for the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer up as a heave offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites as an inheritance. Therefore, I have said to them, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. So the children of Levi, had a specific task among the people of Israel. They took care of the temple. They took care of the things of God. They moved the tabernacle around. They engaged in the actual work of the sacrifices. They engaged in the work of the worship. They lit the candles. They offered the showbread. They poured the oil. They mixed all the things that God gave to them. They did the physical work when the people brought the offerings. Do you know what that's called? That's called an intercessor. So the people were not permitted to come near God. Did you catch what it said? You don't come near the tabernacle. You don't do it. Because if you do, you'll bear your sin and you'll die. Your guilt keeps you away from God. And during the Old Testament, the entire structure of the worship was designed to teach that one lesson. You don't come near God. Your guilt will kill you. Your sin will destroy you. You come to God with the blood of the sacrifice in front of you. You lay it in the hands of the Levite. He gives it to God in your place. He becomes your intercessor. This is what a priesthood does. They intercede for the people, offering the sacrifices, offering the prayers on behalf of the people who themselves are not allowed to approach God. And they got to use the tithe as their inheritance and as their gift from God for that work. Because, frankly, it's a little bit scary. If they do it wrong, they could die. Physically die on the spot. Aaron's two oldest sons proved that case for us. They offered strange fire. They did according to their own desires. And God sent fire out from the altar and consumed them both. And the scripture says Aaron shut his mouth. Okay, God. Right? So the tithe and the priesthood in the Old Testament were specifically interconnected because the tithe was given to them on behalf of God and they interceded for us. But the case that the writer of Hebrews is making is that it goes beyond that now. We'll get back to that in a second, but I just want to drop that worm in your head for a minute. Just think this through. They, they make the point, the writer of Hebrews makes the point, that Levi himself was present in Abram when Abram offered a tithe to Melchizedek. And therefore, the representative priesthood of Levi both ends and begins in Christ. Okay? Hold on to that thought. Let's talk about 
how the tithe itself and how it was used is also representative of what God has done. So the honor given to the tithe is, again, remember, a representation of our covenant with God. All of God's care for his people is demonstrated and is fulfilled as his people trust him with their lives, with their tithe, with their resources, and God faithfully sustains them. God is not shy about reminding his people that to forsake the tithe is to steal from him what is his and to be guilty of sin that he will deal with. Look at Malachi chapter 3. So Malachi, last book in the Old Testament, but if you have trouble finding it, just turn to Matthew and look back to the left just a little bit. Malachi chapter 3, starting in verse 8. God says this. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing, that there will not be room enough to receive it. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Now I want you to pay attention to what God does not say. He does not say, if you're not bringing the tithe, I will cast you out and I will no longer be your God. That would make our salvation a result of our work. What he does say is if you are not faithful with the tithe, do not expect my blessing on your life. If you're not going to be faithful with the tithe, if you're not going to trust me, then don't expect me to show you mercy and give you blessing that you don't want. <laughs> right? You say to God by abstaining from tithing, don't worry God, I got this. I can manage everything that happens. I don't need you. Yeah, I want to be saved. I'm not talking about that. But I don't need your interference in my life. You go your way. I'll go mine. You let me have my way. I'll let you have yours. I'm happy to go to church. And I may throw a fiber in the plate if it strikes me. If the preacher's short and good, those two things have to happen. No money from me. But don't, don't expect me to, to lean on you. I can handle my life. What does God say to that? Okay. Handle your life. Can you stop the devourer? Can you stop the worms? How'd they do with the crickets in Utah? Eat. Can, can, can you stop the, the heat? Can you stop the drought? Put all the chemicals in the sky you want to to try and seed the clouds. Can you actually make it rain or do you just make things worse? Look at how your plants are being burned up from the stuff that's falling out of the sky that they're putting into it and tell me it's helping. Right? Everything in our lives depends upon God to make it work. And when we say to God, I'm not going to trust you with my money. I'm not going to trust you with my stuff. I'm going to go my own way. God says, okay, go ahead. I'll be right here when you decide this ain't working. Because you will decide it ain't working. But what God promises us is that when we trust him and we lean on him and we say, Lord, I want to obey you and I want to trust you and I want to put my life in your hands and I will put my finances in your hands and I will put all my resources in your hands. God says, I will rebuke the devourer and I will rebuke the destroyer and I will cause your things to succeed and to prosper and to be a bountiful sort of life. I will make good on my promise. And this is an amazing thing here because God says to us very plainly in the book of Malachi, test me in this. I can't tell you any other place in Scripture where God lays it down so baldly about anything. Test me in this. See if I will not follow through on what I say. Here's the remarkable truth. 
I have never met anybody in all my life who has been faithful with the tithe, who has not given ample testimony to just how faithfully God abundantly overgives in response to what they give. Over and over and over and over and over again, God is faithful. God sustains. God comes through far and away beyond anything that we could ever imagine. It is because he wants us to see that trusting him is best. So when we trust him, he follows through. When we give him the confidence of saying, Lord, I'm not sure how this is going to work, but I'm, I'm going to do what you say. God doesn't look on us in his little face and say, never mind, you don't really believe. He goes, okay, I'll increase your faith. Let me show you how cool this can be. And he does it time and time and time again. He is faithful to his people. And, and conversely, when his people are faithless and say, Lord, I don't believe you and I don't trust you and I'm not going to trust you. God says, that's okay. You go your way. But by the way, the tithe still belongs to me. So you can expect me to extract my 10% in broken things and in ruined things and in things that don't go the way you expect them to. And there is, interestingly enough, a provision in Scripture for somebody to use the tithe, to borrow it against itself, to say, Lord, I need this right now. I have to redeem my tithe. And God says, you can do that. But when you do it and you pay it back, you have to add 10%, I mean 20%, one-fifth. That's the interest rate that God charges. So when God extracts your tithe, it's been my experience that he extracts it plus 20%. Believe him or don't. Do what he says and demonstrate that you want to trust him or don't obey and allow him to teach you. So he will not bless those who do not obey in the matter of the tithe. He also will not bless those who use the tithe according to their own purposes, according to their own designs, and according to the ways that the world exhaustively tells us we're supposed to do. Look at Amos chapter 4. So Amos chapter 4, starting in verse 1, God says this. Hear the word of the Lord, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountains of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, ow, oh, she's talking about women there, that's me. Bring wine and let us drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness, behold, the days shall come upon you when he will take you away with fish hooks, your posterity with fish hooks. You will go out through broken walls, each one straight ahead of her, and you will be cast into harm, says the Lord. Come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes, every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. Proclaim and announce the free will offerings. For this you love, you children of Israel, says the Lord God. So those who honor God and those who dishonor God stand apart, not only in the action of the time, but in the manner of so using your tithe to worship false gods is just as bad as ignoring your tithe altogether. So we need to be clear that when we're talking about tithing, we're talking about worship, the object of our worship is as important as the act. So let me come back to the idea of tithing and seeing God's increase. If your only reason for tithing is you think by giving God money, you're going to see a return on your investment, and it's not connected to loving God, you got it wrong. Mm -hmm. Make sense? And it's really easy for us to fall short of the target if we're not clear about it at the front. God's promises regarding the tithe is not merely a financial investment, and you cannot enter into it with that as your only reason. Or you will not see his blessing because it is false worship. What are you actually worshiping if that's what you're trying to do? Money. Your money. 
You're trying, to, you're trying to worship the world. You're trying to worship your own increase. You're trying to worship yourself is what it comes down to at the bottom. You see, the action of tithing itself is not magical. It is the faith and trust in God and the obedience unto God as the reason for your actions. God will have his own in every way. And corruption in the tithe is an abomination. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus said this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you pay a tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and you've neglected the weightier matters of the law. You have neglected justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. You are blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. There's a picture. We got the small thing right. We're doing our thing. We're externally obeying on the matter of the tithe, but we have neglected everything else that matters. It's a corruption. He also called them a contagion. If we look at Luke's account of this, he goes a little bit further in chapter 11 of Luke, starting in verse 42. Jesus says, Woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe, mint, and rue, and all manner of herbs, and you pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like graves which are not seen, and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. What is that? That's a defilement. The Jews weren't allowed to approach a grave. They weren't allowed to touch a dead body. They weren't allowed to engage with the dead in any way. And so it defiled them. And what he says is, you Pharisees who have taught people to observe only the outward things without understanding the reality of what it is you're doing, you not only are destroying yourselves, but you are corrupting those who trust you. We become a corruption. So we have to check our own motives. We have to check our own hearts. We have to make certain that we're searching out our, our obedience to God for the right reason. And he also warned them that their outward giving and doing is not good for them in any way except fuel for the fire. Luke 18. Jesus also spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus for themselves. God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give tithes of all that I possess. That's quite a prayer. And the tax collector, standing far off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And this is Jesus' encapsulation of the whole matter. He said, I tell you the truth. This man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For... Everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Amen. See, the truth is, is that if we do not recognize our reason for tithing, and we think that our reason for tithing is simply to exalt ourselves so that we have bragging rights when somebody asks us, or when somebody doesn't ask us and we just have the opportunity to say, I give this much money, we, we've missed it. And we've missed everything that makes the tithe matter. Because at the heart of it, the tithe is about our relationship with God and about us casting ourselves upon Him in faithfulness. We have already done so with our soul. We have already done so with our obedience to ask for mercy. But if we begin to think that our actions make us somehow more saved than not, we, we have misused what God has told us to do. We have become not only guilty, but we have become a corruption. If we believe for one minute that our obedience adds anything to our essential salvation, we're not only wrong, we're probably lost. God does not permit us to steal from Him any glory whatsoever. So the time is about our relationship with God. It's about fundamentally us trusting Him. But how we use the tithe collectively is also about displaying that truth to others. Okay? 
The church is required to be a fountain of God's mercy. Look at Deuteronomy 26 again. I read part of it earlier, but I just want to remind you of what this says. Deuteronomy 26, and we'll start just at verse 12. God gives us some very specific things that we are supposed to be doing. And this is what he says. When you have finished laying aside all the tithe of your increase in the third year, the year of tithing, and you've given it to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat within your gates and be filled, then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the holy tithe from my house, and I have also given them to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, according to all of your commands, which you have commanded me, and I have not transgressed your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. So it becomes an opportunity for us to demonstrate God's love for others of his people. Now, this is fundamentally the reason why government giving welfare is contrary to Scripture. It is not the government's place to care for the poor. It is the church's place to care for the poor. And there's a couple of really important reasons that we need to engage with if we're going to get this right. And the first one is that if the government's doing it, I am permitted to sit back and have no compassion for them whatsoever. If the government's taking care of them and there are programs which allow them to, then it's very safe and very easy for me to go, look, just go, go sign up for it. Just go do it. I don't care. There's also the fact that the government doing it removes them from the human interaction of having to look somebody in the eye and say, I need help, and having to receive that help from them directly. And there is a motivational factor which is involved when, when a society is functioning properly that, that says, I don't like doing that. And the fact that I don't like doing that will help me do what I can to escape that situation. But if I can go to some faceless government agency and some faceless government office and I can receive my check discreetly in the mail, if I can step up to the grocery store with a card and swipe it like every working person, nobody's going to know the difference. There's no shame involved. There's no reason for me to be upset. I can just go on this way forever. And I will teach my children to do it this way. And my children will teach their children. And generational welfare is a reality. You can look at the statistics. The church's responsibility is to engage with the poor in a way that does two things. First of all, it actually renders real aid, but secondly, it elevates the person's worth and character out of the mire that it is stuck in. Because we come alongside them not just financially, but we come alongside them in life. We come alongside them, pouring ourselves into them for the reason of demonstrating to them the love of God. You see, we have nothing that we did not receive ourselves. We have nothing that God himself has not given us. So we cannot look down upon them. We simply want to love them. We simply want to give them something that will help them. And we want to see their character find the purpose that God has for them. It gives an opportunity for us to be loving in what we do. And it is also intensely personal. Because it not only changes them, but it changes us. It changes us to be able to say, yes, I, I want to help you. Versus, all I've got to 20, and I really wanted some hobos. And if I give you the 20... You're not going to give me change, and I won't get my hobos. Well, first of all, you don't need them. They're poison. You don't need that jar, that garbage. Yeah. But secondly, care for the people more than you care for yourself. Amen? That's the calling. It also is intensely personal. When we're called to make judgments regarding whether somebody is in need or simply refuses to work. Mm -hmm.
because that's part of it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says this, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ, that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. So it becomes important for us to be personally involved in the solution instead of allowing the government to simply go its way and reward laziness. Because God does not bless laziness. Laziness is a curse. And it's something that never helps anybody. And it harms everybody. It harms the culture. It harms the individual. It harms the children who come after them. It harms all things when people will not work. God says, you know what? Hunger is a really good motivator. So if a man will not work, neither will any. He'll sort it out. He'll miss a meal or two, and then he'll say, you know what? I should get a job. And he'll find a job because there is always work to be done. But you see, the church's responsibility is to be the ones engaged in this instead of allowing somebody else to do it because here's the reality of it. Government is always going to do it wrong. I don't care what we're talking about. They're going to get it wrong. You know why? Because they haven't set themselves to follow after the principles of God. And when you decide that man's ways and man's wisdom is the right approach, <laughs> it's wrong. They can't do anything but mess it up. Why should we expect them not to? You see, in the end, the generosity changes us and it changes them. It changes our hearts and it changes theirs. And not only does it change their hearts, generosity done rightly with a biblical perspective actually changes lives. This is what God tells us we're supposed to do with our time. This is how the church is supposed to respond. There is an individual responsibility for us to be generous, but there is also a collective responsibility for the church to be engaged in caring for the widows, caring for the fatherless, caring for those who do not have the advantage of somebody to care for them. That falls to us. We, the body of Christ, should be far more concerned to use what God has given us for the relief of those situations than for the advancement of our own things. Mm -hmm. And I know far too many churches that are concerned to make sure we have a lot of money in the bank so that we can improve our building and have a bowling alley. Now, I'm not saying we don't need to take care of our stuff. We do. But we don't have to have gold toilet seats. And we don't have to have, it would be cold anyway, I can't imagine. But we, we don't have to have the things that are so important in the eyes of the world. If the church doesn't get this right, how do we expect anybody to? So the tithe was used for that. The tithe is that confession of God's goodness. And the tithe was used to support the priesthood. The priesthood didn't have an inheritance. They weren't permitted to work. They were dependent upon God. And it showed their unique place between those who gave their worship to God and those who God who received it. But I want you to think about the priesthood of the Old Testament as a priesthood which was bookended. On the front end, it was bookended by Abram's giving to Melchizedek, as the writer of Hebrews points out. But on the rear end, the priesthood of the Old Testament was bookended by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the interim, the priesthood had its place. But following the death of Christ, following his resurrection, following the sacrificial system being completed in Jesus, the priesthood ceased to have a place. It is no longer needed. Now, this is important for us to understand because they showed their submission before they began and they've come to the end of their time and there is now no acceptable priesthood except Jesus Christ himself. The 
Catholic priesthood is an abomination. Mormon priesthood, an abomination. Buddhist priesthood, an abomination. Pick your religion. I don't care. There is no priesthood except Jesus Christ. Because there is nobody who can fulfill the role of standing between you and God but Jesus. Amen. He alone is our intercessor. Not, not any other teaching, nor any other orthodox teacher, nothing. Okay, So I am not your priest. I am your pastor. It is my responsibility to equip you. It is my responsibility to prepare you. It is my responsibility to teach you. I pray for you. I pray in an intercessory fashion. I come alongside you and beseech God's favor on your behalf. But I do not believe for one minute that your prayers are any less valuable than mine. And neither should you. Lost people say things like that all the time. And I usually correct them. Sometimes I don't because there's just no point. But I usually try to tell them, you know, you can seek God's face. You can cry for mercy and then he'll hear you too. The only reason God hears us is because of the work of Christ in our lives. And if you are found in Christ, that reality is true for you by the same ground that it is true for me. I have no special knowledge of God that is not available to you as well. You understand that? Because the priesthood that matters is the priesthood of Christ. And any Old Testament priesthood is ended. Now this matters for our belief right now, but it also matters for those who think that the New Testament promises that a restoration of the Old Testament priesthood is coming. It's a lie. There will be no restoration of the Old Testament system of worship and the Jews will never be saved by adherence to the Old Testament law because the scripture plainly says that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. Our salvation is through Christ and Christ alone and it will always remain so. And the only reason why the Old Testament priesthood had any value at all is because God was counting that as a time-marking thing until the coming of Christ. Look at me at Romans chapter 3. This didn't make it into your thing because I didn't think about it until just now. But you need to understand this. Romans chapter 3. Let's finish the connection. Romans chapter 3, starting at verse 21. Now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, so God is vindicating his own righteousness, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That means that the Old Testament work, when it worked, only worked because God was looking forward to Christ. Not that the priests were looking forward to Christ. They weren't going, oh, I believe that Jesus is going to come. They believed God was going to keep his word. But God was looking forward to Christ. And he counted their obedience as faith. But that time is done. Christ has come. He has been revealed. He has finished his work. And he is the only priesthood that we will ever need. He is the only priesthood that will ever stand. He is our only representative. He is the only one who stands between God and man. And there is nobody else who has the power, the access, the means, the authority, or the basic worth to intercede on your behalf. This means that those who say, Mother Mary, pray for us, are praying to empty air, and they will receive nothing from it but condemnation. 
Those who pray to priests and those who pray to, to, to saints and those who pray to anything but Jesus Christ or pray to God through the name of Jesus Christ will have nothing for their trouble but condemnation. Because it is only Christ that can stand before God on our behalf. And you need to understand I'm not making this up. 1 Timothy 2 verses 5 and 6 say this. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And that means that he is the only ransom ever given. So when the Catholic Church elevated Mary to be co-mediatrix and co-redemptrix, they did it in the face of Scripture and said, we don't care what God says, we will do what we want. And they are promoting a lie that billions of people around the world are believing. And they will be condemned because of it. Jesus Christ is the only one who can stand between us and God. And he is the only one who can atone for our sin. No priest has the power to intercede for you. For the sacrifice has been completed. So the sacrifice of the mass is an abomination. It is not true. It is not faithful. Beloved, here's the rest of the story. If Christ is the only one who can stand between you and God, and the priesthood has been bookended, and Christ is the completion of it, where does Christ dwell? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Where? In you. This means that you are the priesthood of God. Every believer who trusts in Christ is the priesthood of God. It is bookended in Christ. And because you are in Christ, you are the priesthood of God. All of us, every last one of us. Peter says this in chapter 2 of 1 Peter, verse 9. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, hear me. If you are a child of God, you are of more worth than kings, than presidents, than senators, than movie stars, than billionaires, than the people who the world call the elite. You are of more worth than all of them put together. For you, child of the king. You are a child of God. And all of this is given to us by what Christ has done. See, the tithe and the priesthood, they're intimately connected. But they are defined in Christ. And they are bound to our hearts by our obedience and our allegiance to the God who is faithful to his word. That's our reason for everything that we do. And while we're very comfortable to say we believe it in matters of salvation, there has always been this disconnect among Christians throughout my life that I've known who have a hard time taking God at his word anywhere else. Our calling is to trust him, to believe him, and to obey him. Not only because of what he has done, but because of who he has made us to be. We are his children. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you give to us grace in this day, and that you would help us to understand, and that you would help us to believe, and that you would help us to trust. God, let us be a people who take you at your word, and who know that when you give a promise, you fulfill it, and who know that nothing that we ever do in obedience to you will ultimately cost us, but will always be a source of blessing. God, it may cost us in the short term and temporarily. It might even cost some of us our lives to say the truth and to speak the things that you say. But God, that is still game. Let us take you at your word in everything that you say. Let us honor Christ and let us live this out. That Christ, our great high priest, will receive the full reward of his sacrifice. Would receive the full reward of his suffering. And that he would be honored in hearts where he is now despised. 
We ask all of this in the precious and perfect and holy name of Jesus.